Okay, AP Latin, this is some serious business. So as you can see, I've dressed appropriately, and the fact that I'm wearing this has nothing at all to do with the fact that I went to Eastside today and helped make a part of the recording for the virtual seniors honors night. Instead, it's that now in this video, I'm going to offer up some strategies and things that maybe you can do next Tuesday for those of you who are still taking the exam to help yourself be successful. So let's walk through it and hopefully uh, you can use it to your advantage. Um, time is going to be of the essence. Time will be everything on the exam. So please don't get bogged down in these things that I put forth and find yourself running out of time, not being able to answer the questions uh, and being able to submit it. First and foremost, what you need to make sure that you have are both of your textbooks with you. They are incredibly helpful for the fact that in the back, there is obviously a glossary of all the words if you needed to look something up. I don't know that I would do that simply because time is of the essence. And then secondly, is that as you know, having used it, um, there are commentary on the uh, left-hand side when you are reading it that might be able to help you answer some questions. So make sure you have both of those ready to open them up right to the spot, uh, but don't spend more than like 20, 30 seconds. And, and that really, the time is going to fly by, I'm telling you. All right, now the second thing that you want to do is make sure that you have a good translation open and available. Uh, I would highly recommend, first and foremost, of uh, maybe looking for the following. One is uh, Tony Klein or A.S. Klein. Uh, you can see here Klein and his Virgil translations are pretty good. They are not 100% literal, but they are really, really close. So when you look here and you see the, of course, Virgil, 70 BC, 19 BC, the major works, poetry and translation, uh, you can have this right here open and ready to go. I say that this is a good place to go for this poetry and translation, not only because his translations are good and I like them, but also because if they were to throw you a curveball, and I don't think so now, I used to think so, uh, but not after yesterday. Yesterday they released a practice exam uh, on the AP um, reviews that they've been doing via YouTube. We're going to look at that today, uh, and I think that they're going to stick to the Aeneid. Uh, but in case they do did throw you a curveball, you can see uh, right here. Um, so let's say uh, the section from uh, uh, um, Virgil is book two, uh, and let's say it's book two, 559 to uh, 620. Again, you can see you can quickly uh, navigate uh, right there, and boom, uh, it brings it up there for you. Then for the first time, a wild terror gripped me. I stood amazed, my dear father's image, blah, 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 all that stuff that you can see that is there. So it's easily easily navigable. Um, the problem is that for Caesar, there is nowhere near as many um, options for good, literal, modern translations. Uh, if you open up a new one, uh, when you type in, let's say, Caesar, uh, literal translation, uh, what you get is something from essentially the turn of the 20th century. And I am familiar with this because I've seen it on quizzes and exams. Uh, and so, you know, I would, I would, Use it, but again, do not completely be uh, um, uh, dependent upon it. Uh, w. A. McDevitt, I think this is from like 1906, but still you can see it here. So let's say it were from book four, and remember it is book four, uh, chapters 24 through 28. So you can quickly scroll down, find the right chapter that it is, and you can have that available for you as well. Um, I might, if I could find it, have another laptop with which I'm doing this. Uh, that way you could have, obviously, your laptop or computer that you are dedicated to the taking of the exam and maybe another one to where you can do sorts of uh, things like that. Of course, you probably want to have open the recordings page uh, to where you can quickly navigate and find out what it happens to be. So let's say if all of a sudden it's um, uh, Caesar, uh, chapter, or book six, uh, chapter 18, you can quickly go here, go to book six, and just quickly find uh, the chapter 18, uh, right there it is. Uh, I might wanna stay away from the translation only, even though I go a lot faster, because um, I might have an ability uh, to um, uh, uh, give you some answers inadvertently from my previous translations when I talk about and discuss the chapters uh, in, in depth. And so you want to be able to obviously uh, find all of those. Also, you might want to before then, uh, go and look at selections in English, 
Uh, you are supposedly responsible for um, the entirety of uh, book one, both what we read in Latin and what we read in English, but there's no need to read it in English simply because uh, right here you quickly can see uh, line by line exactly what goes down and what is uh, happening here is kind of like a little um, uh, summary as it were. Uh, here is uh, AP Aeneid. I quickly go through and just break down what's going on in these sections that we do read in Latin. So that is of uh, some help that you can have. I do the same thing for the DBG uh, as to what goes down in each of these chapters. And so we can skip book four and there what you have in book six. Uh, and then uh, the De Bello Gallico sections in English. Uh, here's a quick summary of what goes on in each of those books. I wish I had a more detailed one, but alas. And then the same thing for the Aeneid. Here is every single book of the Aeneid. Uh, um, spark notes, uh, are basically a summary that you can see, uh, and it walks you all the way through it. So you might want to take a look at those that we are responsible for, um, particularly in um, the Aeneid. You might want to quickly, and it's only a page, uh, look at book 12. Uh, you're supposed to know what's going on with that uh, as well. So uh, use those resources just to quickly uh, become familiar with all of the things uh, that you're supposed to have in English. Now, this next tool is one that is going to be of tremendous help. So you want to pay close attention to it. So if you quickly Google Perseus, oops, first thing that will come up as you can see here is Greek and Roman materials. Click on that, Perseus's digital library. This is going to be awesome. You're going to be shocked by it. I would make sure I have this available. So all of this stuff will come up. So what you want to do is you want to control F, Virgil, find it. Virgil, and there he is. Do you see him, Perbius Regulius Maro? Open up that tab and lo and behold. Now what you want to do is stay away from English. Like this is a translation of John Dryden. You will not want a hundreds and hundreds of years old from the 17th century translation of the Aeneid. Instead, what you will want to do is you want to go for the Latin. You see it right here, Latin, click it open. And what you will then see is that the Latin text is there. And over here where it says Virgil, Aeneid, 1-1, one, one, you can obviously go and say line 418, 418, which is the B simile or where you will find the B simile. And so there it is. And what's great about this is that you can hover over any word, click it, and there it is. It tells you exactly what it is. It's a verb, it's third person plural, subject they, perfect tense, did, and then here, indicative. Poetic means the alternate form, so you can see that. And so there it all is laid out for you. That could be of tremendous help if they were to ask about the case of something or the tense of something. Um, for example here, Skynis, I click on it. Now, it will give you options, and here it's either obviously noun, feminine dative, or feminine ablative, but it will show you here the most likely of the options. Not always is it 100%, and I say that because um, I'm going to give you an example in a moment of how you can find that they have made a mistake, but with the translation and with the text in front of you, I find that this could be of great help to you. So open up another tab, and let's go ahead and go back to 1-1. There it is, so you can see that you can navigate to wherever you need to go by there, and so you'll do the exact same thing. And Make sure you have all of this stuff open uh, before you are ready for the exam. So Perseus uh, and Tufts, there it is. Uh, once again, you click on Greek and Roman materials, right there you are. And this time you're going to be searching Caesar. Control F, C, A, E, S, A, R. There we go. And you don't want Caesar Augustus, rather you want guys Julius Caesar. There he is, right here as you can see him. So go ahead and click that open and you don't necessarily want the English. You can open up a tab for that if you so wish. But again, this De Bello Gallico uh, the, the English translation is going to be rather old. And so go ahead and click on the De Bella Gattaco by T. Rice Holmes, incredibly famous uh, classicist. So there you are. And you're in the same exact situation to where the first number is the book, the second number is the chapter, and the third number is like the verse number. Say so they break it up further. Uh, but um, if you got rid of that, there you go. Uh, it'll give you the whole thing. And so therefore, let's go ahead and say that we were in 613, which is 
uh, the books that we never read in class. Uh, so I click on Honore, and I did this earlier. So when I click on it, um, it says that the number one possibility is from Honorus that you see here, and that it is an adverb, honorably. Well, that's not the case. It actually, pun intended, is the case of that it's from Onor. So Onor meaning obviously honor. And so here you can see that it's a noun, singular, ablative, masculine. So sometimes it can lead you astray, but for the most part, um, it's going to be on the money uh, whenever you have an opportunity that is there. So um, let's now take a look at the sample exam that they brought out yesterday. So if you haven't, I would go ahead and visit the, um, uh, um, the AP uh, channel uh, to where they've been streaming stuff here. And if you scroll down all the way to what they had yesterday, which is going to be, uh, there it is, practice exam one. You click on that. Uh, let me go ahead and pause it. Uh, there we go. And what's important is right down here when it says show more, here is that practice exam that they gave yesterday, which today at 6 p.m. they're going to be going over. And I'm actually going to go over it with you right now. Hopefully my answers line up with what they say. Uh, also, if you want to, you can go ahead and click on see what the 2020 online exams will look like and be prepared for test day. Please make sure that you do that. And also there is this other uh, uh, link right here, five steps to take before exam day. Uh, I know that most of you are taking multiple exams and you want to make sure that uh, at least from a technical side that you're ready for all of it. But uh, for right now in this, I'm going to take a look at it. And this is what pops out to me. And I talked with uh, Mr. Yagi yesterday on uh, uh, over text about uh, how one, it does not look that difficult, but two, we see the direction that they've gone in. We've been debating on would they try to write questions that would be um, um, un uncheatable, things that you couldn't Google, things you couldn't easily answer. Well, I don't think that they've done that. They've, they've given you an uh, exam and will give you an exam in which you can cheat, but the problem is, and we'll look at it now, and remember that the exam is in two parts. Let me go back. And the first part is going to be 25 minutes with five minutes uh, given to you to submit it, then your answers. Uh, the other part is, and this is going to include one passage of Virgil, books one and two, and then one passage of Caesar, books one, four, and six, and then short answer questions, which we're about to look at. Then what they're going to do is that they're going to give you one singular passage of Virgil that is at sight. It's not a part of the syllabus and they will give you 15 minutes to answer them. And so here you can see the potential problem that you'll run into. Time. If you think about it, the one passage of Virgil, here they've chosen uh, lines 430 to 437, uh, which is the B simile. And over here, they've chosen <coughs> De Bella Gallico 1.3. And essentially this was, I think the 2013 exam uh, that they then expanded upon a little bit. They will not probably do that for the uh, actual uh, exam next Tuesday, but just do the math. You only have about one minute, 10 seconds, 15 seconds to answer each one of these questions because there are 18 total questions. And so how they are going to get around the issue of people being able to cheat on the exam is that if you get too bogged down in the other things that I've shown you, like that Perseus place, then you could easily run out of time. And so let's take a look at the questions that they have asked. So first and foremost, it is the B simile that you see here, qualis apes aestate noa per floria rura and so forth and so on. Question number one, name one and only one literary device found in line one and write out the Latin word or words that illustrate it. I would have just said qualis simile, just like. That's it. However, you could have chosen any number of things. Quickly look for a synthesis, which is remember the pattern of A, B, A, B, or chiasmus, A, B, B, A. Uh, you can easily look for something like assonance. I would say apes aestate, maybe as assonance. But here you can see aestate is with, of course, uh, Noah, uh, and then Floria is with Rura. Aestate is a noun. Noah is a adjective. Floria is an adjective and rura is a noun. And that then makes a chiasmus, A, B, B, A. So simile and chiasmus are both available there. Number two, what noun is the subject of exerket? And translate that noun and verb pair in context. So it is that the labor exercises and it's present. That's one of the things I think that they're looking for that you have obviously here that is present. 
And let's see how quickly I could go to uh, book one, 430 in Perseus. So book one, 430, there it is. Boom, I'm looking for a Xerket. Uh, there it is. And boom, it tells you present tense and it lets you know translated exercises uh, or works if you would like here. Keeps busy is another option. But again, don't be bogged down. You will run out of time. You will run out of time. You will run out of time. So the labor makes busy. Translate in context cum in line three and identify the type of clause it is contained in. The cum here is right there, when, and then a ducunt is an indicative. So this is what we call a cum temporal clause. It might behoove you uh, to go and look over maybe some of the study guides that I have of the um, um, uh, what you call it the 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 uh, subjunctives uh, just quickly looking at them uh, you can here go to my website uh, there we are and say right here uh, go all the way down for Latin too because that's when you first learn the subjunctive scroll all the way down open up subjunctives and you've got those subjunctive uses list but I also have uh, a a uh, study guide for all kinds of things. So, um, cum clause is study guide. You look at it right here, uh, and I can quickly walk. This is not something that you can do while taking the exam, though. I guarantee you that. But here you can see cum temporal clause. It's with an indicative verb, means when. You might just want to scan over these, and I'll see about putting them all in a singular spot uh, to where you could obviously review it between now and next Tuesday. You've got one week, uh, and certainly, um, you know, you have time to use some of that stuff. All right. Uh, the next one, what noun does dulki in line four modify? And what is the case of that noun? So going back again, I go to dulki, and there it is. Uh, and uh, here it's led you astray. It's not dative here. Uh, instead, dulki, which does mean sweet, uh, it is ablative. That's uh, what you see here, uh, the second one. Uh, so again, you can see that Perseus can lead you astray sometime. However, maybe with a combination of your knowledge, which is the most important thing you have going for you, if you know the lines decently well, you don't have to have them completely memorized, you will Dulki is modifying nectare, which is ablative. And so if you were to have clicked on nectare, that could have then made it clear to you as to what it's modifying right here. Nectare, there it is, certainly ablative nectar, uh, if you would like a uh, drink of the gods. But nectar is what it means in this context. Going back. Uh, to the next one, uh, name one and only one of the beast tasks described in lines five through six. So in five through six here, uh, obviously you could have said that receive the loads of the ones coming in, uh, or they drive away the lazy herd, the drones from the stalls, and then you would just simply uh, write out the Latin for that. And so uh, for this one, you would have said simply uh, Arkent Fucos, drive away the drones. But you could have written more, obviously, for that as well. Uh, translate in context to a preceptibus and identify the use of the ablative. So um, from the stalls, and it's just ablative uh, place from where or, or location from, uh, if you so wish. They might talk about things like ablative of separation, they could call it, uh, but I'm sure that they would take place from where. Identify the tense of fair wet line seven, and this would be perhaps something that uh, um, it could help you here with Perseus. So if we go and find that fair wet, and there it is, you click on it and boom, present tense. Remember that E in a verb could be future dependent upon what conjugation it is, but here uh, it is a second conjugation verb uh, and that allows you to know. And you can see it right here with fair way uh, the second conjugation form indicating that it obviously is a present. Going back, uh, identify the case and the use of Moynia. Uh, Moynia is walls. Uh, oh, fortunate ones whose walls rise. Walls here is nominative and it is functioning as the subject of surgunt. Uh, and we could obviously really quickly check that there. And, ooh, see, that's problematic. It's led you astray once again. Um, so it's, it's coming here. It's, it's accusative. It's not. But again, you can use, hopefully, the combination of translation, your knowledge, and obviously, uh, maybe a suggestion that Perseus has given, but it is nominative in the context. And so there it is. Finally, according to Jupiter's prophecy in book one, what city does Aeneas' son build? And for how long do the descendants rule there? Answered one to two complete sentences. 
the answer here uh, is Alba Longa. Alba Longa is the mother city of Rome, and uh, his son, Ascanius, is going to be the builder of Alba Longa. And again, you can get this information in the uh, other parts of the English of Book One that you were supposed to have read, and they are going to rule over Alba Longa for hundreds of years. Uh, because Aeneas is right around the year 1200, 1100. Rome is not founded until um, the, the 753 BC. So let's move on to the Caesar. And again, um, you know, you're going to run out of time. You're going to run out of time if you are not familiar with the lines and can't answer some of these on your own. Because 25 minutes, 18 questions, it's a real tight window, uh, unless you're quick on the mouse with all of the resources that have available to you that you can see up here at the top. Okay. All right, so following along, uh, there we go. Uh, it says, uh, this is, of course, De Bello Gallico 1.3. Uh, so I would have quickly have pulled that up, maybe. De Bello Gallico, there we are. And so let me go ahead and pull up 1.3. It should take me no more than about 10 seconds to have it available, should you need it. Uh, hit enter, and boom, there it is. So this is the part that we are dealing with here. And so you see, translate the phrase, actore or get origus per moti, and identify the case and use of auctoritate. So, uh, the phrase is obviously, having been moved by the authority of orgetorix, uh, it would be either the means or the cause, I would argue. Uh, means and cause. And if you need a review of our case uses, um, I can certainly, let me make a note of that. So, uh, a little quick grammar view case uses that I have in Latin 1 and 2. Essentially, I'll just take the Latin 1 document and expand on it to include the items that we've seen uh, in, in here. But nevertheless, the case and the use is ablative, and I would say ablative either of means, it's the thing that makes them moved, or ablative of um, cause. It's the cause of them being moved. Identify one, only one thing the Helvetians determined to do, one through four, and write out the Latin so one through four, it's quite a long bit. You've got tons of stuff. Uh, they decide uh, to buy some stuff uh, for the purpose of sitting out. Uh, they prepare to buy a largest possible number of carts, a larger number possible of draft animals uh, to make plantings. Uh, you have it right here to make as big as planting as possible uh, and uh, to firm up the peace with their friends, uh, their nearest neighbors. So all you'd have to do is name one, write out the Latin for that. Uh, translate the pray phrase ad proficis gandum and identify the verb form proficis gandum for the purpose of setting out. That is a gerund, obviously. You can see the ND, uh, and it's for the purpose of setting out ad plus that, uh, which you could easily get from a translation or otherwise. Translate in context, quam maximum numerum, and identify the degree of maximum. Maximum is, of course, a superlative, and it's as large a number as possible. Remember the quam plus superlative. Give the tense, voice, and use of the infinitive confirmare, tense, voice, use. So I go quickly find it. I really don't need this, but confirmare. I should be at 1-3. Let's see if I can find it really quickly. Uh, should be around here somewhere. Uh, uh, confer there it is. And it's a present active infinitive. Its use um, is merely a complementary infinitive, you could call it. Um, I guess it's just a complementary infinitive. I don't like the idea of the masking of the use. Uh, I guess you could also stretch uh, they uh, decided uh, upon an action. And so therefore you could even say that it's functioning as the uh, noun direct object of what they decided uh, uh, to do. But they're probably looking for something along the lines of a complementary infinitive that you learned back in Latin 1. Identify the case and the use of biennium. So here, biennium is, there it is. Uh, they thought that a biennium, it's accusative, and it is the subject of the infinitive, was enough for the purpose of getting this stuff done. If you need to confirm that, you could go to biennium, that is here, and right there. Uh, it's 88% uh, uh, sure that it is accusative, and it is the subject of an indirect statement. You're probably going to get at least one or two questions on either ablative or indirect statement from Caesar, so because he likes it so much. To whom does Sibi in line six refer? Uh, for themselves. And so that would be, of course, the Helvatians, uh, the ones who are getting ready to go. Identify an ablative of accompaniment in this passage. Accompaniment, you are looking for a cum. And so uh, in this passage, uh, 
Uh, here we are, ablative of accompaniment with their nearest neighbor. Strengthen the peace and friendship. There's your ablative of accompaniment there. And then finally, uh, what is one reason Caesar gives later in the Bellum Gallicum for attacking the Helvetians? Answers in one to two complete sentences. Um, you know, you just have to do the best that you can on this. Uh, what he does is because he, he remember, uh, the part that we read in Latin is that he was remembering of how they were mean to that previous consul and that they forced his army to go under the yoke and that they had killed that consul. He didn't think that they were going to be nice and just merely move the province and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I think you have a really good shot. This is not difficult stuff whatsoever. Um, the problem is going to be time. Um, uh, this is easy, easy stuff. The one word that I kept using yesterday, uh, and, and, and my back and forth, Mr. Yaki is accessible. Uh, this is not impossible stuff. So let's take a look at the, of course, site passage. And again, time will be of the essence. 15 minutes, seven questions. And here you can see it's Aeneid 12, 803 to 809. Really quickly, uh, this might be the only one that I would, of course, have, uh, um, um, looked it up. So I go to here, I want to go to the Aeneid, book 12, and what did I say that it was? Uh, 803 to 809. So going back to my poetry and translations, 803 to 809, it's going to be right in there. And so I've got to find it. And that's the problem, uh, finding exactly where it is. If you don't have a word-by-word uh, -word translation, um, so, you know, that that's where you run into a little bit of trouble. But over here, you can, of course, use Perseus as well, uh, that you can find book 12, 12, and then 803 to 809, I think it was, 803, there we are. So here, 800, and 800, 803, and there you are, right in here. Uh, Trianas putuisti infandum ad kendere, let's see if that's correct. Uh, no, wentum. Uh, the one line before, Ventum ad supremum est, as it were. And you can obviously use it as well. Uh, there's probably somewhere on here an ability to click, and I don't know where it is, but um, to to be able to hear view by default translation, so you can see there, uh, that could turn into a translation for you as well. Hit enter, and hopefully maybe it will show up. Uh, but you can play around with this, but... Uh, 803 to 809, up went to him. So there it is in these lines that you could obviously help to ask, answer any of those questions that they pose to you. Um, going back to here it is. So it says, name one and only one thing that the addressee has been able to accomplish. Uh, and so um, I hope I'm still recording. Nevertheless, one and only one thing that has been able to accomplish in lines one through four. Uh, if I run out of this, it's not recording anymore. I'm kind of worried that it's not recording, but oh well, we'll see if it has uh, quit on me as of yet. Nevertheless, uh, it says one and only one thing that the addressee has been able to accomplish in lines one through four. Uh, it has been come to the final. Uh, you have been able to agitate the lands uh, or uh, the Trojans with waves uh, in fandom. An unspeakable thing to to akendre, to set fire war, to stir up war, to deform the house, and to mix the marriages with grief, luktu. Uh, I forbid you to try further. This is Jupiter talking, thus Jupiter having spoken, Orsus. Um, uh, thus the goddess, uh, Saturnian one, against these things with her submissive face, with her face having been sent down, indeed, since, uh, uh, O oh great one, your will is known to me, that freaking will, O oh Jupiter, great Jupiter, and I have left behind Dernus and the lands, I unwilling. And so it says, one thing the addressee has been able to accomplish, well here, to agitate the land, right there, give the Latin for it, boom. Name one thing or literary device found in line three, again, I would try to find the simplest thing, look, De formare dominum, you could easily say alliteration and be done with it. Uh, et luctu miscere hymeneos. Uh, let's see, uh, a syncope, uh, or not syncope, syncasis, uh, uh, interlocked word order. De formare is an infinitive, miscere is an infinitive, dominum is its object of deformare AB, and then again AB, syncasis, 
uh, could be it as well. So uh, really easy to try to find. I would try to find the simplest things that I could. Alliteration, which of course is consonant sounds. Assonance, which is uh, of course, um, um, uh, losing my train of thought. Uh, uh, vowel sounds, uh, and uh, then of course uh, chiasmus and synchesis are always good ones as well. Uh, translate sic Jupiter Orsus, uh, thinks of Orsus, and go and let, let Virgil help us here, uh, or Perseus, I should say, uh, to begin to lay a war, the Oreo or Orsus, uh, beginning, uh, so it's not a noun, so I would say to set about to undertake to begin here, obviously, uh, and here it's perfect, so having begun, if it's a perfect passive masculine noun, but Ordior, look at it, is a, um, uh, uh, a deponent, so having begun. Uh, would be the appropriate translation there. So please pay attention to those clues. So thus Jupiter having begun, having s begun speaking as it were. And the tense of course is perfect. Translate submisso wultu and his construction, abel of absolute, with her face having been sent down. And uh, here you can see uh, the easy identification of the ablative, but you could always go and let Perseus help you. Uh, over here it says, um, what other Roman name do we know the entity here is Saturnia? That'd be Juno. Uh, and the origin is because Juno is the daughter of uh, Saturn. And so that's therefore she's the Saturnian one. We saw her addressed in that way back in book one uh, when she was referred to as the Saturnian one. Uh, and so it would be Juno is really Saturnia, another name for her, and complete sentences they're looking for uh, she because she is the daughter of the Titan Saturn. Identify the case and use of Jupiter, line seven, talking directly to him. It's got to be vocative, direct address, the adjective that modifies it. Magne, right there, direct address. And I didn't find a translation, first person verb from this passage. Are you going to look for something ending with O? That's a verb, or ending with I. And here it is. Waito, I forbid, or relinqui, I leave or have left behind. It is perfect. So, nevertheless, those are my walkthrough. I hopefully will make a case usage sheet that will be good for you. I might try to combine an all in one place, a quick review over all things. Uh, uh, subjunctive that might be of help to you, uh, but uh, those two uh, uh, things I'm going to get on. Uh, I still am working on. Uh, those of you who have submitted short answers uh, uh, on Canvas, I'm still working on working my way through them. It's a long slog. I promise I'll have them done by the end of the weekend so that you can have some feedback with all of that. Uh, and for those of you who are not taking the exam, I hope you're doing well. Uh, those of you who are, I hope you're doing well, and I hope you have good luck. And I appreciate you listening. Uh, hope this was helpful. Bye.